good morning, everybody. I think I can say, dear friends, if I look around, <laughs> the little fighters community who is going on to push public and to push our governments, um, and not ours, but also the one in the United States, um, which I think is doing the best, thanks heaven. Um, we are going to talk about the Black Sea and its strategic uh, importance today. Uh, we have one, two, three, four <laughs> distinguished speakers, like the Americans always say. I will start with Andras, Andras Rasch, uh, who is an associate fellow at the Security and Defense Program at the DGAP. And um, the security and defense people have become very important since the war started. And the time before, I think, if you would have had the chance to speak out louder and warn us uh, when the, it was time to act earlier, probably would have helped everybody, especially Ukraine. Thank you for joining us. I know that you have to leave within half an hour, so you, you will get the floor um, uh, as the first person. Then we have Tamila. I don't see her at the moment. Um, she is an old friend of ours. We have traveled together in Germany when Igor sent, I don't see her, when Igor sent her. I'm here, Marie Louise. Oh, there you are. Hello, yes, hello, hi. Tamila. Uh, we traveled through Germany together campaigning when Igor sent um, was um, sent into the Gulag. And she now has an official, uh, official job, which is permanent representative of the president of Ukraine in the Autonomous Republic of Crimea, <laughs> but unfortunately still in Kiev and not uh, in Sevastopol yet. Okay, then we have Olga Skripnik. I think we have met before also. Das ist sehr schlecht, dass ich hier nicht die Bilder ja, sehen kann. Olga um, uh, is, the, there she is, is the chairperson of the Crimean Human Rights Group. And uh, she had to leave um, Crimea 2014, like both women, I think, who are talking here. And she is now active as a chairperson of this Crimean human rights group, very important because we tend to forget about the atrocities and human rights violations, which are taking place since 2014 and not only since the war started. And then Wilfried Jäger, um, may I say an egghead, Ukrainian egghead <laughs> in a positive way. I think he's somebody who has all the knowledge in his head. Uh, about Ukraine, ask him if you want to know something. And he thankfully has been in the working group of the Bertelsmann Foundation, who came out with a real brilliant study. Again, before the war started, and unfortunately, I think too few people read it because it showed very clearly how strategic the Black Sea is and uh, how, what a strategic importance Crimea had for the Russian side to prepare this next attack. He is now in the Center for International Peace Operations, but a colleague in the DGAP also. So um, I think we are amongst those who have the best knowledge. So <clears throat> Andras, uh, let's start with you. Um, I think until now you might explain that a little bit, but we have to understand that um, Putin is more strategic than once in a while we think in the West. Once in a while we say, well, he doesn't know what he's going to do tomorrow. Uh, if you look at Crimea and the military development, I think you can tell that he in fact has been pretty strategic, maybe more than the West was. So it did become an importance uh, on this next step of the war, which he started in February. Uh, we now uh, want to talk about the importance of Crimea uh, for the Russian warfare. We want to talk about 
the Black Sea and its strategic importance, not only for Russia, but for the West, which it should better understand. And of course, we have to talk about Odessa. Uh, can we have the feeling that it might be safe or isn't it safe at all? And um, we just had a little debate because uh, when we announced uh, this uh, Zoom, there also was the question, how, uh, how should the Ukraine pursue the plan to deoccupy its other regions in Kherson? And I remember when I was in Odessa, probably two months ago, beginning of May, yes, two months ago, and the governor told me we are going to start an offensive in Kherson pretty soon. And he seemed so sure that it will be successful that I felt wonderful when I left Odessa. And I think now things turn out to be more difficult, less optimistic. I hate to say that because it doesn't help to be pessimistic, but it helps to be realistic also. So a big bunch of questions, Andras, and I want to ask you to go ahead. Thank you very much, Marie Louise. Thank you for the invitation and for uh, for having me here today. Uh, again, I apologize because I, of, of the need to leave earlier. So, uh, if one is working under time pressure, my personal solution is that I always speak very fast. Oh, so please stop me if, good for us. <laughs> if, if, if that happens. Um, so, when it comes to the, the role of the Crimea, uh, one needs to see clearly that. The Russian military presence, namely the Black Sea Fleet in the Crimea, has played an integral role already in the 2014 occupation. I mean, Russia utilized the bases and the logistical background and the troops located in the Crimea to take over the peninsula already in the spring of 2014. And ever since then, Russia has been uh, uh, strongly militarizing the peninsula. So if one compares the number and composition of the Russian troops stationed in the Crimea, let's say in 2013, so one year before the occupation, and right now you see uh, the numbers and also the composition multiplied several times. Interesting enough, Russia is deploying or has been deploying to the Crimea, not only military assets that would uh, protect the peninsula against the Ukrainian attack, not only. Russia is also fortifying the peninsula in order to repel a possible NATO attack and also to extend its control uh, over the Black Sea, meaning in practice, a large number of anti-ship missiles, multi-layered air defense systems, modernizing old Soviet airports, deploying uh, new aircrafts, fighters, bombers, and even attack helicopters. So this militarization process, or technically speaking, or historically speaking, re-militarizing process that has started in 2014 uh, bore fruit already by 2022. So when the current invasion started on uh, the 24th of, uh, of February this year, uh, if, I, if you remember the beginning of the first days of the offensive, the only direction where Russians really managed to reach, uh, to, to achieve a breakthrough was actually the, the offensive starting from the Crimea. Already on the 24th of, uh, of February, Russians managed to break through the Ukrainian defenses on the de facto border of the Crimea and, and the Kherson region and advanced on the very first day more than 130 kilometers and reached the, the, the line of the Dnipro at Novogahovka. Comes the question, how come that Russians could be so successful in that? First, they amassed massive numbers of troops in the Crimea. So they really prepared in the Crimea and used long range artillery, used attack helicopters, used very precise intelligence gathering to supply to support their operations and um, starting from the peninsula heading heading north and then northwest and it's not only it was not only a one-off you remember from the very beginning of the war that russians were advancing very fast on the southern front both towards the west so in the Kherson region and also towards the east so towards the zaporizhia region why could they do that dear colleagues it's because of logistics Russian logistical system is based on railways. And the offensive starting from the Crimea could rely on the existing railway network. This was an important difference compared to the Kiev direction 
or compared to the Kharkiv direction, even the Donbass direction. So the Crimea has played, and the, the Crimea and the railway network and the bases, and also the ammunition depots and storage facilities, military storage facilities, pre-deployed in the Crimea, it played an integral role in the success of Russia's southern offensive, heading both towards Mykolaiv and also towards the, the Zaporizhia region, uh, Melitopol, Berdyansk, Mariupol. And uh, even now when Russia, at least temporarily, secured control over the Azov, Ukraine's Azov Sea shoreline and occupied Kherson, and now is the, the fighting is going on between Kherson and, and uh, the Mykolaiv region, the Crimea is still the key logistical hub for, for supplying Russia's operations in the east, sorry, in the south. So that's why I said that the Crimea is not a one-off. That it, they just use it once, and and from then on they re, they rely on something else. No, the Crimea and particularly the Crimea Bridge, the Kerch Bridge, is a key logistical line, uh, supply line for the whole Russian offensive in in the south of Ukraine. And besides the logistical role, of course, Russia deployed significant multi-layered uh, air defense assets, anti-ship assets to the Crimea, as well as very developed signal intelligence assets as well. And of course, in the whole offensive, Russia's Black Sea fleet stationed in the Crimea, strengthened by assets brought over from the Baltic fleet and the Nordic fleet. So the Russian fleet has also played a key role in the offensive, particularly in the first basically two months of the offensive, when it was not yet clear whether Russians would reach Odessa, whether Russians would, F would try uh, a landing or an amphibious operation against Odessa. Fortunately, and that's the time for the good news here, uh, Ukraine, with the help of anti-ship missiles, both domestic developed anti-ship missiles and also Western anti-ship missiles, managed to push the Russian fleet relatively far away from the coastline. I mean, the sinking of the Moscow, Moskva cruiser, it was a watershed moment, but it's important to remember Moskva was not the only Russian ship sunk by the Ukrainians. So right now, the Russian Black Sea fleet is around 200 kilometers away from the Ukrainian shorelines, uh, which means that if things do not change fundamentally, it's highly unlikely that Russia would attempt an amphibious operation against Odessa, because there is no way that they could negate the threat of anti-ship missiles. Uh, another good news for, for Odessa is that if Russia is not going to go for a partial or general mobilization, they, they are, then they are gradually going to run, not run out of, but run short of ground troops once the battle for the Donbass is over. Right now, Russia is concentrating more than 80% of its forces deployed to Ukraine to the Donbass. And uh, the fighting for the rest of the Donbass, so the, the Ukrainian control part of Donetsk region's region is going to last for several more weeks, <clears throat> if not months. So most of Russia's forces will be bogged down there. Even if they manage to take the Donetsk Oblast, we don't know it. But even if they manage to take it, take it, they will suffer so heavy losses that unless Russia goes for a general, for a mobilization, which would result in tens of thousands of new Russian troops appearing at the front line. So unless this happens, I do not see that the Russian Federation would have enough ground forces for at attacking again Mykolaiv, particularly Odessa. That's the good news. The bad news is that even though a Russian ground attack or amphibious attack against Odessa is highly unlikely, the Russian fleet is still able to maintain the blockade of the port of Odessa. Even if they have been pushed far further away from Ukraine shorelines, both the fleet and also the anti-ship missiles located in the Crimea are still able to block shipping in the western part of, uh, of the Black Sea. So this is, this is not going to improve anytime soon. And besides maintaining the blockade of, uh, of the Black Sea, Russia is using the Crimea also as a platform for launching missiles against Ukrainian targets, both Mykolaiv, both Odessa, and a number of other targets. So the Crimea acts not only as a logistical hub, not only as a back, background support point, but also as a platform for actually attacking Ukrainian territory. This is not going to change for the better anytime soon either. So that's it for, for me for the start. 
And if there are any questions, I'm happy trying to answer them. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Andras. I have the privilege to start uh, with the first questions immediately. <clears throat> uh, two, two more questions. Let's put aside the question of the occupation. I think it's too difficult to talk about it at the moment. Um, but uh, we learned that there was the wonderful fuck off island, <laughs> Snake Island has been handed back over, not handed back over, but the Russians had to leave. I immediately, since I learned thinking in traps, I thought that it might be a trap. I will tell you why. The, if you talk uh, to Western politicians at the moment and diplomats, they tell you we are about to lose the countries of the South, because what they see is that there is food shortage, food becoming more expensive, plus um, um, oil and gas becoming more expensive. And uh, in this uh, thinking, you had this French attempt to, uh, to make a corridor, a protected corridor from Odessa in order to transport grain. Uh, like I said, I'm thinking in traps, so is the Ukrainian army. They said, well, demining our, we know what demining uh, our port would mean. It means, yes, grain can leave, but it also means Russian boats can come in. So maybe you give us, uh, you give us a little, idea on what we have to think about that. Thank you. The main reason why Russia is unlikely to, att to attempt any kind of amphibious operation against Odessa is not the mines. The main reason is the anti-ship missiles. Mines are also important, but uh, mines are not protecting the whole shoreline. Okay. I mean, there's no need to discuss publicly the number and distribution of the mines Ukraine has laid. Those mines help protecting the port of Odessa, help protecting some other segments of the shoreline, but they, would, they are not enough for protecting all the possible landing grounds for Russian invasion. The main threat from the Russian perspective is the anti-ship missiles and increasingly Ukraine's long-range artillery supplied by the West. Mm. So even if the mining would take place, uh, it would still not be easy for Russia to, to attempt uh, an amphibious operation. Also because the units or the elite forces which could have been used for the amphibious operation, meaning particularly the 510th Marine Infantry Brigade, uh, these units have been used and wasted at the Battle of Mariupol. So Russia's elite mar Marine Infantry units suffered serious losses in, in Mariupol countering the very strong and the really heroic Ukrainian defense. So Russia is short of also the troops necessary for an amphibious landing. Still, uh, I agree with you that one needs to be very, very cautious with this plan to demine the port. And thereafter, let's hope that, uh, that Russia will behave in the way it should behave according to the agreement. The problem with, I mean, the trap I see here is that there is a sequence of events and the sequence of commitments. Meaning first Ukraine has to demine the ports and thereafter, so that's the Ukrainian commitment. And thereafter starts the Russian commitment to let the ship through. And the trap I see here, is that what happens if Ukraine fulfills her commitment, so opens a safe passage on the minefield and then Russia decides not to fulfill her commitments. No mines anymore, but also no shipping. So, I, so I'm, I would be very cautious with, uh, yeah. with, with this particular, with yeah. this particular, uh, let's say, arrangement. Yeah. So I hope this goes for an answer. Thank you. Yes, Andras, thank you very much. Uh, one more little comment, which I just have to make, although it might not be political, political correct, using um, using a webinar like that. Um, we just had another open letter by so-called intelligentsia in Germany. Again, it was actually recycled, but again, demanding our German government not to send weapons to Ukraine uh, 
because it will prolong the war and in, in, for the sake of the people, uh, Ukraine should stop fighting. Um, if you, yes, Andras, you might be very surprised because I don't know whether there is any European country like Germany where there is so many initiatives like though this one coming from Germany, coming from a country, which actually, if it's looked into its history, had to learn that our grandfathers, uh, Nazis grandfathers had to be fought down by weapons. Now you have the strong grandchildren generation that tells Ukraine that you better should not fight. Um, and if I listen to you, Andras, uh, it is almost like being making the campaign for Kremlin to put a long story short. Because when you tell about Odessa and what has kept Odessa from being occupied and taken over by the Russian troops, which always includes terror, um, if you um, would take away the weapons that have been delivered until now, Odessa already would be in Russian hands. Period. I had to say that because um, I almost can't breathe anymore. Also with our media, taking those people who never have been in Ukraine or Russia as experts and giving those advices to you Ukrainian people and our governments, of course, which for me is really nothing but cynical. Okay, so I had to say that. Now I will keep my mouth shut because it upsets Upsets I fully me so agree much. with you. Yeah, I absolutely. Full, I fully agree with you. Calling for peace at this moment, it would mean that we basically legitimize the Russian territory again so far. Sorry, but this, this shall not be the case. Plus, and open part, the door for regaining even more, for gaining even yeah, more. And, and part, I mean, uh, if you allow me to be a bit cynical, yeah. In the first few days of the war, one could have possibly trusted that Russians would behave like, like normal occupational forces. But after Bucha, after Irpin, who could reasonably think yeah. that stopping the fighting would ease the suffering of the people? Yeah. I mean, what we see about how the Russian troops behave on the occupied territories, I'm sorry to say so, but exactly the opposite is happening. Yeah. So at this point, calling for a peace, hoping that it would ease the suffering. Sorry, no, it wouldn't. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely on the same page with you. Thank you, my dear. Uh, thank, you. thank you. And I feel ashamed, like, because I said it seems to be a very German attempt, and that makes it even worse. Dear women, uh, Olga and Tamila, will you please help us giving us an, an idea so that we don't forget uh, the human rights situation now on the island. Maybe Tamila, you start? Yes, of course. Yes, thank you. Uh, first of all, I thank you for you, uh, Marie Louise and Libmot, for highlighting the issue of Crimea in your activities during actually years. Yes. And I greet all honorable colleagues. And first of all, I want to thank. Uh, for the um, uh, all support provided to our country from citizens, from civil society organizations, and of course uh, from your government, um, uh, um Very uh, important uh, to say that our uh, mission uh, was uh, supposed to work in the city of Simferopol in Crimea. However, due to the temporary occupation of the Autonomous Republic of Crimea and city of Sevastopol, uh, the mission was transferred to Kyiv and Kherson. And after the beginning of the full-scale invasion of Russia against Ukraine, the mission uh, suspended the operation of our offices. However, at, the, at this moment, uh, the mission resumes uh, uh, our work in Kiev, uh, unfortunately not in a Kherson office because uh, it uh, was hacked in the middle of uh, March by uh, Russian occupying uh, military forces. Uh, may I uh, say today maybe a few key trends uh, after this full-scale invasion. 
uh, one of the uh, topics I want to touch uh, today is um, uh, uh, outcomes of the militarization of the peninsula. Uh, thank you for you, Andras. Uh, you mentioned it ba basically we are witnessing how Crimea was turned in a military base from which an offensive to the Ukrainian mainland is launched. Uh, currently, Russia uh, launched missile strikes from the territory of the peninsula and in its territory uh, waters. Uh, they targeted Western Ukraine in particular, actually. Potentially, uh, they can easily reach EU countries, Asia. It is uh, a threat to the entire Black Sea region. Uh, the Russian Federation continues to illegally conscript the Crimean residents into a military service in the army. Since the beginning of the temporary occupation of Peninsula twice a year, it's conduct conscription campaigns. Starting from 2015, the occupying administration illegally conducted 14 conscription campaigns, forcing about uh, 34,000 Crimeans to serve in the armed forces of the Russian Federation. Uh, for evading the Russian conscription, Crimean uh, youth today face uh, criminal liability. Uh, there is also evidence of ongoing hidden mobilization in the temporary occupied territory of Crimea, de facto and uh, contrary to Putin's promises, the Crimeans uh, called to uh, serve in the Russian army are pat uh, participating in the aggression against Ukraine. Ukraine uh, for many of them, means uh, waging a war against their own actually country and their own people. One of the striking examples is the conscript of the cruiser Moskva. Uh, whose uh, crew probably uh, consi um, consisted uh, also of the uh, residents of temporary occupied uh, territory of Crimea, uh, we aware at least about uh, one probably death of the Ukrainian citizen who uh, was conscripted to the um, Russian Black Sea Fleet. Uh, this is uh, definitely not in a single actually case, but it's very illustrative. Young boy from Crimea who falls a victim of the occupation regime. Uh, there is, is no way his parents uh, can learn the truth about uh, the fate of his son. As Putin says uh, years ago about Kursk submarine, uh, sometimes ago it's sinked. Uh, how he de facto says about conscripts, say disappeared after 24th of February. According, that, uh, according to information of uh, mission collected from open sources, as so of beginning of July uh, 2022, at least 108 soldiers of Russia army have already been buried in the temporary occupied Crimea, uh, 56 of whom are probably citizens of Ukraine. Uh, the numbers of burials may be greater since some of them occur without uh, publicity. Uh, also, I mentioned uh, a few words about propaganda. Uh, Crimea has been under propaganda pressure for eight, year, uh, eight years, but with the uh, beginning of the full-scale uh, aggression and invasion, it has intensified. The information environment has become very toxic. Propaganda activities are regularly organized in Crimea to justify Russian military aggression against Ukraine and distort the events in mainland Ukraine. Thus, according to report from Ukrainian li uh, Ukrainians living in the temporary occupied Crimea, school administrations are forcing uh, staff to uh, spread propaganda among uh, children to justify the war against Ukraine. Teachers are told to communi communicate uh, the reasons and goals of the special military operation to children uh, completely and accurately to make videos uh, in support of the army and the president of Russia, force uh, children to learn Putin's speech. Uh, despite the fact that eight years 
um, the Crimea was uh, cleared of those people who were ready to protest, especially Ukrainians and uh, Crimean Tatars. Today, there are still courageous people uh, who come out with anti-war slogans, publish anti-war posts on social networks or in personal messages, go out to solitary uh, protest and um, street actions in Crimean cities. Most of the activists are facing administrative uh, penalties, in uh, some cases criminal charge. They are also subjected to harassment by the occupying uh, security uh, services. The majority were held liable under Article 20.3.3, Russia's uh, Court of Administrative uh, Offences, public actions aimed at uh, discrediting the uh, use um, of the armed forces of the Russian Federation. This article was introduced into Russian uh, legislation uh, on uh, 4th of March this year. Uh, it's directly uh, tied to Russia full-scale invasion of uh, Ukraine uh, and it's uh, uh, designated to facilitate the punishment of anyone who speak out against the invasion, including those in the occupied territories um, uh, Crimea and Sevastopol. According to the NGO Crimean process, more than uh, 76 reports of offenses uh, were drawn up on the peninsula under this article between uh, March 4 and the end, end of the May. Uh, now we, are, we understand in uh, July 6, uh, we uh, even uh, have more cases on these offenses. Okay. Uh, the uh, the mission is constantly trying to communicate with uh, Crimeans who are protesting against the war. Uh, those people are very brave. Unfortunately, some of them have already left the peninsula because of the threat of their lives, uh, but some continue to stay there. Uh, some cases shock and uh, uh, outrage with the um, head hatred with uh, which the occupying authorities uh, persecute people people in Crimea, some, someone uh, is brought to justice just to private uh, chatting or messaging, some for postcards in mailboxes with the inscription that it's not scary to be detained, it's scary when there is a war. Uh, or, for example, a teacher who tries to explain to uh, school children uh, what is Nazism and fascism uh, is are, and that um, this phenomenon does not uh, does not exist in mainland of Ukraine. Or, for example, Bogdan Ziza, it's a Crimean artist. Uh, he painted the occupation administration in Yevpatoria in yellow and blue colors, and now he prosecute uh, in Crimea. And maybe uh, uh, last trend uh, which I uh, must to mention. It should be said separately about the representative of the Crimean Tatar community who initially in one way or another directly or indirectly expressed their position against the occupation of Crimea. Now some of them are facing uh, prosecution uh, for their anti-war uh, statements. In particular, uh, long-term participants of the Crimean Tatar national movement, Abdul Rashid Jeparov and Zahir Smidla, who were detained for 15 and two days uh, respectively. Uh, Crimean practice of illegal searches and detentions in, uh, is in increasing uh, being used against Crimean Tatar uh, in the newly occupied territory in Kherson and Zaporizhia re region also. The fate of Crimean Tatars in this region is currently one of the uh, our key, uh, key concern actually. For instance, there is a Crimean Tatar community of approximately uh, 10,000 people in Novo Alexeyevka of Kherson region. About 70% uh, had to flee after 24th of February. According to the um, uh, testimonies of one of the Crimean Tatar <clears throat> families in Novo Alexeyevka uh, who survived, survived uh, to search, uh, the searches 
occupant state uh, while uh, turning the uh, home of those people upside down, uh, we have the order to eliminate all Crimean Tatars. Okay, thank you, Tamila. Thank you. Wilfried, now um, <laughs> you have the difficult task uh, to tell us what we have to expect. Number one, I would love to ask you, you came out with this really brilliant study on the importance for the Black Sea, for the Russian side, and for the Western side. And uh, actually everybody who knows a little uh, more about Putin's strategy, at least starting visibly, well, actually with Moldova and Transnistria in 2001, but then uh, with 2008 Georgia, which already meant Abkhazia, of course, is a country of its own, but the coastline, of course, is under the influence of, of Russia and then Crimea and now the Azov Sea, <laughs> actually, and, and Odessa with a question mark whether Putin's military might be able to reach it. How come the West being so naive or reluctant or I don't know what? Don't they understand? Can't they think strategically? Are they afraid? Do they want to give the Black Sea to Russia, which has never happened before in history? Never, ever. <laughs> What's going on? And maybe tell us a little bit about Turkey. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Marie-Louise. I think uh, let us start with a very principal uh, statement. Uh, we should understand that the Russian design in the South is not counted uh, via legislatures as we do in the West. So they have an imperial design for a longer time. So even if I, and I do so, support in general the analysis of Andrzej, and even if we take into account the shortages of Russian armed forces we have seen since February, we should be clear that the aims of Russia in the South go beyond Ukraine, and that the Black Sea region is crucial, or let me say even the wider Black Sea region, to begin with the Caspian Sea, to go through the Southern Caucasus uh, into the Eastern Mediterranean is also a platform of power projection against the West. Mm -hmm. So we can say actually in the South, we have a focus, what Putin had in mind in February, not only to expand, uh, to, to, to make real imperial expansion at the cost of Ukraine, but also to disrupt the security order, which was mainly preserved by the West. I mean, that we should really be clear of that. Uh, and I think what, uh, <laughs> what is the reason why we didn't see that or why the Western partners didn't see that, that is, of course, something up for discussion in the next future. I think we really should make a retrospective analysis. How could things develop as they develop? Yeah. Um, uh, I think that at first we, and that is very interesting actually for Germany, uh, which did so much in West in lessons learned about history, but actually in Germany, politicians did learn to, to read the identical politics discourses in Russia. I mean, uh, Mr. Putin from, let me say, the early 2000s already announced the very high importance of Novorossiya for the Russians. The concept did not fall from the sky in 2014. It was well elaborated. And what our stakeholders should learn again is to take the signals of autocrats very serious because they, let me say, they cover their strategic aims, which they want not to directly discover in the present. They cover it with projections into the past. Mm 
Um, that is uh, the first thing. What we have Thank to you, do now... uh, Wilfried, may I just step in in yeah. this moment? Yeah. Uh, since you mentioned uh, the German history, I think it's really important to work on that, not only uh, asking what happened under Angela Merkel's uh, 16 years, but longer than that. And is it somehow that uh, a country like Germany and maybe even the West, because France is important also, that we forgot or did not allow ourselves to think in geostrategic dimensions? Is that one of the answers that we could not decode, that we could not read the Russian plans, although they were talking about it openly? Yes, and I think uh, we were, yes, absolutely. And we were too much concentrated mm -hmm. on mutual economic connection mm -hmm. uh, with Russia. Uh, we were, let me say, when it comes to Germany, too much concentrated uh, at a role as a mediator and didn't want to disturb or to violate that role, um, loudly declaring what is going on on other fronts of the conflict. And I mean... It begins with a failure of a clear analysis eight years ago, what happened with the Donbass. The Donbass was only a side event, which in between uh, uh, led Russia to fail because in fact they tried already, to, uh, at that time, they tried to establish a land corridor to the southern Black Sea region, so the southern lands of Ukraine. So it begins also with a clear analysis and, and with the readiness to face the confrontation and to take the confrontation. So um, the second point is um, when it comes, uh, I think, to the misunderstanding of a mediator role, it, is also, uh, it was also, I think, a big mistake to think that we cannot change Russia or that we cannot influence at all what Russia is doing. For example, when it comes to the step-by-step -step closure of the Azov Sea, which is a precondition also what happens now. So uh, when you spoke with diplomats, uh, they said, oh, Wilfried, what do you want with monitoring? What do you want with sanctions? But that is not true. Uh, some years ago, Russia really seriously looked how the West reacted. And I remember this only a little example when we had the attacks, the military attacks on Ukrainian ships in 2018 after the build up of the Crimean Bridge, which was, by the way, also a heavy violation of international law. Um, we, we could observe that Russia, when uh, they observed the discussion in European Union about financial sanctions, about the monitoring of the situation, they reduce the blockade of the ships. So what I want to say is we at first did not exploit our possible capacities, how to influence on Russia. Uh, and secondly, we forget to understand uh, that actually our system is dependent on the functioning of international laws and rules. And you should every time bring up violations under, uh, onto the uh, international community. And by the way, that is now very important when we are discussing with the South what to do with Ukraine exports. We should explain that the problem has started already in 2018 with the blockade of Azov Sea because it reduced the capacity of Ukraine to ship even more grain to the South ships. Yes, and we lost to do that. Therefore, it was a mistake not to intervene uh, with diplomatic initiatives mm. and sanctions when we already had these big closures around Crimea in 2021, uh, when we all had these uh, developments in the Azov Sea, and that also should be uh, reestablished. Uh, what we can do now is uh, we can now at least be careful when it comes to the negotiations under the um, let me say, under the leadership of United Nations, of a grain corridor in, in, the, in the waters. Because uh, we also should be clear that here is one another, and I will uh, take now your last question about Turkey. Uh, we should understand that Turkey, who is now 
playing a role of a mediator, is in high need of a solution uh, about the grain. Because at first, Turkey needs the grain, because we should understand that Mr. Erdogan, who faces already the pre-election campaign in his country, and who has so big problems to preserve his power, needs some success or some prestige victory uh, to show up before his voters. Because um, the economic situation actually, thanks to his policy, is disastrous. And that is actually including the bread prices, which are very high in Turkey. So very simply speaking, Erdogan is interested in a deal. And why it is also the case, his system, the basis of his system is an oligarch system of oligarchs who developed under his rule in the last years. And one of the main assets of these oligarchs uh, is actually the commercial shipping. Um, so there are two aims for uh, Mr. Erdogan, uh, to get a solution to bring his prestige uh, into the international scenery as a big mediator, um, what is also important for his nationalist electorate. And uh, secondly, uh, to simply uh, feed his own system, uh, which is preserving his power. Okay, Wilfried, the question then is, uh, <laughs> if somebody is of need, is in need like Erdogan, is that a risk because he will go for Russia's interest and mingle with them? Or can it be used for him becoming the, uh, the counterpart uh, of Russia, taking into account that Erdogan with his uh, ideas of resurrecting the Osman Empire, uh, I mean, Putin's ideas are not, um, I don't, are, are familiar for, for Erdogan because he thinks in, <laughs> in, in terms who are a little bit the same, who doesn't have the military power, but anyway. So could he we somebody who would say, well, due to historical reasons, uh, we never can imagine Russia really taking over the coast of the Black Sea, or will he be so weak that he has to give anything to Putin that Putin wants? And the UN, unfortunately, I have to say that being so naive very often with compromises who never turn out to be good. Uh, I think we should be very careful and excuse me, but I would rather into I would be rather inclined to support more your second thesis. So I think it's very much about power politics for Mr. Erdogan. And that would lead to a situation that he may be will accept a solution which is not quite secure for Ukraine. Mm. So let's make a deal, yes, um, somehow. Uh, and uh, even if we um, cannot uh, solve any uh, problems with demining, or there's another very important demand of Russia to control the outgoing grain ships uh, in in uh, uh, beyond the coastal zone of Ukraine, but that would mean in the exclusive economic zone of Ukraine. So they want to legitimize their position in a sea which belongs to limited sovereign waters of Ukraine, because they know that they cannot move their soul uh, freely for the reasons Andras uh, gave us. That would be also already not acceptable. And all these details, which are very important for Ukrainian security in Odessa, and also I mean, you have to also to think about the future and also for Ukraine to re-establish the international law and the own sovereignty in that waters. What is, by the way, not an aim also of our stakeholders. We speak already about the lines of 24th of February. It would be also very important for the West to speak about the sea um, uh, and the situation in the sea. But that is very important, and I think that is a big cha uh, challenge. The uh, second point, what I mean, there are also other solutions discussed. I cannot speak about that in public, uh, but even if the Ukrainians uh, will not demine, or, or, or will not, or even if there will be solution without demining, 
yes. Um, I think it is very sure that Russia will never agree to have a ceasefire for the whole procedures of shipping out the grain in the next, let me say, four to five months. So the situation will be very unclear, even if we get a, uh, a solution, even without demining, yes, even when the Ukrainians can bring out the grain with their ships, uh, because they know where the means are lying. Um, um, but uh, you have so much uh, um, opportunities for Russia uh, to make some hybrid accidents uh, during the war. So that is a very, 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 um, so, so we really should fulfill and we really should stand up for all security demands being fulfilled uh, for Ukraine. Um, and, and that is important. And there's another problem, uh, Marie-Louise, with Erdogan. But what happened in the last uh, days, uh, we already, I think we can say, we have good indications from uh, also Ukrainian journalists that Russia is bringing the kid kidnapped crane from Ukrainian lands to Turkey, not only to Turkey, but also to Turkey. And, and now the question is, <laughs> uh, will Turkey accept that fact finding and uh, implement measures against that, against Russian ships or not, because that can also violate uh, the, the position of a mediator. And if it does not do that, what we will have, we will have a situation when Russia can say, oh, see, we have a nice solution under UN uh, leadership. Yeah. So it is an international solution. The West cannot be against that. And on the other side, Russia will continue kidnap and transport uh, the grain of Ukraine to, to, to other parts, including Turkey, as well as to further shell the storages of grain, which is foreseen for hungry people in the South. And, and that will be also a big uh, problem of the information war. Yeah. in the next days. And thank you, uh, Wilfried. It's a really black perspective because you can see how the uh, blame game has already started and you can see that the blame will tend to stay with the Ukrainians because uh, I get very nervous that Western countries more and more uh, start talking about how we lose the common front, which was able to set up in the General Assembly, those 140 countries saying um, this is a aggression, it's a crime of aggression, voting against it and being outspoken and open to Russia. And uh, a lot of people who work within the UN or have diplomatic uh, relations or governments now, including the French and the German, they say, well, we are about to lose the South. We would never have voting like that again. And it is uh, due to the food shortage. And if they now offer a compromise to, to, uh, to transport the grain uh, and Ukraine will be the ones to say, you guys, that's too dangerous for our security. And we've had We've seen Russia lie whenever there was any compromise, any treaty, anything. All they did, cold blooding lies. You know, they didn't care. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's really a very, very dangerous blame game. And it's very good that we start to talk about it. And I think we have to do campaigning and enlightenment about it. Okay, thank you, Wilfried. Uh, back to you. I hope now, Eura, that your uh, line is better. Thank you. I can see you again. I Let's go to. back to the situation on Crimea. And I think you step in with uh, what we've been talking about uh, and what you see. Uh, being on the free ground, still on the free ground of Ukraine, but having those close connections to Crimea. Thank you, Maria Luisa. I hope now it's better and you can hear me. 
So I represent the Crimean Human Rights Group, and to correct that said, we continue our work in field in Crimea. And we have been working in Crimea since 2014. So uh, I would like to focus on maybe uh, two more points, two more uh, trends in Crimea now, and uh, many of them Nila mentioned, and two points more. So first of all, political persecution continues in Crimea, and now at least one country, 30 citizens of Crimea were deprived of liberty due political motivated criminal persecution. And most of them are Crimean Tatars. And most often, Crimean Tatars are being persecuted on false charges. So, being members of his good Tahrir or Crimean Tatar Cherubi Jihan volunteer battalion. And, like example, uh, on June 1st, the Supreme Court of Russia designated the Crimean Tatar Cherubi Jihan volunteer battalion as terrorism and banned it on the territory of the Russian Federation. And Crimean Tatar was also arrested on these charges in the cities of Kherson or the Parisia region, newly, newly occupied by Russian army, and transported to the detention center of Crimea. Next, the restriction of the freedom of speech are getting stronger. Uh, maybe you know, in March, President Putin signed a law criminalizing so-called fakes about the actions of the Russian army in Ukraine. The law introduced punishment, criminal punishment for disseminating known information about the activities of Russian armed forces, as well as for destroying the use of Russian uh, troops. So um, Russia continues to persecute civil journalists. And I think very, Illustrative case is case of Irina Danilovich, a healthcare worker and citizen journalist, disappeared in April. And Irina Danilovich had been kept in the basement of FSB building for eight days, put a sack on her head, uh, and threatened that she would be taken out the forest in the hills something. She was also threatened with uh, deporting to Mariupol, blocked by the Russian. Also, Vladislav Isipenko, a freelance journalist of uh, Project Premier Reality, Project of uh, Radio Liberty, is still in Simferopol Detention Center. So, Tamila mentioned about administrative article about uh, the public actions aimed and discrediting the Russian army. So, uh, first case we fixed in uh, March uh, when uh, uh, in Simferopol, the first for anti-war slogan against a Simferopol resident with a blue and yellow um, cardboard sign and the words no to war. And Camilla also mentioned about Bogdan Ziz, a Crimean local activist. Uh, so, but uh, at the same time, the occupation authorities of Crimea persecute not only for expression, peaceful assemblies, religion, activists, civil activism, journalism, uh, or any disagreement with Russian actions in Crimea. They also persecute lawyers who provide professional assistance to victims of political uh, repression. And like example, in May, Russian security forces detained four lawyers uh, who have been helping victims of human rights uh, violations in Crimea since the first day of Russian occupation. And the so-called judge uh, fined one of them and three of them sentenced to five or a days of administrative arrest. Maybe a few words more about uh, forced mobilization. Uh, Tamila mentioned about uh, illegal conscription uh, in Crimea. Uh, it was just in autumn that Russia possibly mobilized 3,000 Crimeans. These mobiliz mobilized Crimeans were sent to take part in hostilities against Ukraine. Uh, Putin said that not only a contract, uh, that only contracted soldiers are involved in the war against Ukraine, but uh, this is not the case. He sends conscripts, including those from Crimea, to this war. And one more, on June uh, 30th, uh, the so-called head of Crimea, Aksonov, signed a decree of uh, on mobiliza uh, mobilization. This means that the Crimeans will continue to send to military actions against Ukraine. And uh, since February 24th, uh, we, uh, we has, have been uh, collecting data of the dead and captured Russian military men related to military units. 
and the Russian uh, authorities are trying to hide the information about actual number of dead and wounded among the Russian military. Such information is not provided in Crimea. However, morgues and hospitals uh, are overloaded in Crimea. And one more and very important issue about militarization of children. All these years, Russian authorities have used education to militarize uh, children and youth. Uh, on the eve of the invasion, more than 270,000 children studied in schools in Crimea and Sevastopol. And after February 24th, the mil militarization of uh, education has continued, with education being used to justify the war crimes of the Russian Federation and to build up a positive attitude towards this so-called special operation. In the first days of the full-scale Russian invasion, schools in some districts of Crimea were closed because these areas were used to, for military purposes to attack Ukrainian cities. And in the first days, they detected lessons um, where children uh, were told about the need for so-called special operation against the Nazism were held in many schools. The position presented uh, of the school lessons implants that Ukraine is an artificial state. It has no history and the Ukrainian government is said to have been waging a war against its own people. And the children are also actively involved in online and offline actions to support the war against Ukraine. Such actions are usually held by the UNARMIA, Youth Army, and Crimea Patriot Center. Uh, these are the main organizations in Crimea dealing with militarization of children and their training for service in the Russian army for many years. And today, the Russian authorities are using the Crimea experience for eliminating the Ukrainian identity and militarizing through education in the newly occupied cities and towns of Kherson and the Parisian region. And maybe last but not least uh, about Russian propaganda. Of course, the Russian propaganda has long been preparing the Crimean society for war with Ukraine. Our research of Crimea media has shown that in recent years, the image of Ukraine is enemy um, and hatred uh, towards Ukrainians and Crimean Tatars have been purposefully implanted. We are recording now that these days the Crimean media are justifying the war crimes and crimes against humanity committed by the Russian army and calling for the genocide of Ukraines. And I think it's very important issue uh, that we need include when we're thinking about next step for the occupation and reintegration of uh, Ukraine. Thank you, I hope you can okay. listen. <laughs> Olga, thank you very much. Um, I think um, you can see, we can see that the talks about accountability, at least I would say have started. Um, I, I see uh, your hand with it. Um, and I think this is very important. Uh, we know that um, international law usually moves very slow. We just had 20 years of ICC. And unfortunately, I think 20 cases they have been dealing with within 20 years. And only within three, there was decisions uh, to um, uh, to persecute uh, the countries and three was no persecution and 17 others were uh, turned down. So yes, justice is moving very slow, but still we have seen one example where, where we never thought that it could ever happen. Uh, with Bosnia years afterwards, uh, there was jurisdiction and it was very, very important uh, uh, even if it was years later, to create some kind of justice. So <clears throat> when I talk to, when we talk to our government, they say we are already uh, giving more uh, material possibilities to the general persecutor. The general persecutor of the ICC has been unusual in an unusual short time has been given the possibility to start investigating 
Are you working together with them? Does the Ukrainian government, Tamila, uh, with being in this crisis, having to handle the war, the refugees, having to start on a EU key, do they have um, the facilities to provide all the data which I think we need so that someday we might have accountability and at least some justice? I have a few words about Ukrainian NGOs experience. Uh, after 24th, uh, Ukrainian NGOs created coalition, 5 AM coalition. It's time when we heard Russian missiles on 24th of yeah. February. And now 29 uh, Ukrainian NGOs uh, are members of this coalition. So we have been uh, documented uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity. And of course, we work closely with ICC. But at the same time, I must say that uh, we understand that ICC is not the only, only way to justice, to accountability. We uh, we sure that we need to create new mechanism, new mechanism of accountability, like special tribunal for crime uh, yeah. of aggression, because ICC now can uh, investigate only war crimes and crimes against humanity, but like meta crime, main crime of Russia, uh, it's aggression against Ukraine. That's why we think uh, this tribunal will be very effective mechanism. And one way for this, of course, on EU level, so now many negotiations are being in Brussels between Ukraine, between Ukraine civil society and EU uh, for this creation of tribunal of the crime of aggression of Russia against Ukraine. So, okay. of course, we, yeah, we work with this issue and also, I, I think very important that Ukraine can somebody, build... Excuse me, fact, somebody is in the back having his microphone on and we hear a child play, which is wonderful, but maybe not in the microphone. <laughs> okay, Olga, you go on. Yeah? Yeah, and last point uh, about that Ukraine must to build effective uh, system on investigation, war crimes and crimes against humanity. So it's very important that all EU countries uh, will uh, help Ukraine to build this system of accountability and investigation yeah. of programs in, uh, in Ukraine. Thank you. Thanks. Um, thank you. Bef I, I won't uh, open a new uh, topic. I think we will have to talk about this crimes against uh, crime of aggression, war crime and gen genocide. Wilfried, I saw you raising your hand. Yes, thank you, uh, Marie Louisa. I only want something to add uh, to my colleagues Tamila and Olha, and that is about Kherson region. Uh, we have also cases already of forced mobilization in Kherson region. Mm -hmm. So men are uh, abduced uh, to front lines to make fortifications, to dig out trenches. And what is the consequence together with the fact that many men also flee from Kherson Oblast uh, via Crimea to have better, best, better incomes than in the disaster situation in, in Kherson? The, the consequence is that we have a lack of male labor forces in the region. That means mm -hmm. we have a lack of doctors, we have a lack of, uh, labor constru uh, of um, street constructors and so on. And Russia now has launched a program which eases for Russian citizens uh, um, getting double incomes uh, to uh, fill up these positions. So people mm -hmm. even not from Crimea, but from regions all of Russia. And what does it mean for the people at place? It means, um, and that is, by the way, also a heavy violation of international uh, 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 humanitarian law, it, it, because it is also a hidden demographic policy in the region. And what is so important? Uh, of course, if you get the proposal as a Russian, and if you are very talented as a doctor, you never will go for double income in a region with, uh, which is full unsecure, in a region where the population is absolutely not loyal to the mm. administration. Mm. So the, the consequence is that you will get very bad personal stuff. 
and mm. only one very cynical uh, example. Uh, Russians already sending students of, uh, of uh, lower semesters to mm. fill up positions of specialized doctors in the region. Mm. I mean, please imagine what does that mean mm. for the people? Mm. That mm. is a, the first thing. And that should be also uh, loudly explained yeah. in the international community. And the second point was made, what makes me very nervous, also when it comes to security, is a new law in Russia, which, easy, which will ease even more to annex a territory because uh, con according to the new law, you already need not uh, address uh, of another government the territory is belonging to, uh, what they did with the so-called republics because they said they are independent. Uh, you now can simply annex a territory by a pseudo referendum. And I think uh, these moves in Russia would be already a good opportunity to call up for the Security Council because we have to imagine that we are closely before a new full-fledged annexation of mm. territory. Thank mm. you. Excuse me, I only wanted to add that. Yes, thank you very much, Wilfried. I think, again, this information uh, about what is happening within the occupied territories is so important for those who still claim that surviving is better than fighting. And obviously they don't have an idea and they don't want to, to have an idea of what is happening within the occupied territories. Um, before I turn over to you again, Tamila, I do have a question. We do have a question uh, from the chat. I will put it to you, although I myself think it's very difficult. Um, it says, what do you see as the likelihood that an offensive on Kherson could be successful? And what conditions would have to be met for that to happen? I put it, uh, yes. I, I marked that it is very problematic you decide <laughs> how you want to handle it. Okay, thank you, Marie Louise. Uh, actually, very important to say uh, that uh, Crimea is not a military, only military base, but actually it's a, a base for doing this uh, new occupation of territories of Kherson region and Zaporizhia and uh, do this really um, not only war crimes, of course, uh, and, war, uh, uh, and uh, crimes against humanity, but also uh, human rights uh, persecution in uh, newly occupied territories. Not uh, only against uh, uh, Crimean Tatar community, which I mentioned in my uh, preview, uh, uh, story, yes, in, in, in Novoleksiv and Hnichisk, but also in city of Kherson. Uh, according to our uh, information and testimonies of uh, uh, people who flee uh, Kherson region, it's near uh, 600 uh, people who now in uh, different basements in uh, Herson and uh, city of Herson and Herson region. It's a different place. It's, it's a, a colony in uh, Herson. It's uh, uh, some educational centers in uh, Herson region. And it's uh, some uh, vocational bases uh, uh, near Dnipro River. Uh, and it's a huge, of course, problems because we understand that they uh, not uh, uh, that uh, this uh, occupy, occupying power killed people, uh, persecute people, they torture people, they transfer these people from Kherson region or the Parisian region to Crimea for example, for city of Sevastopol and Simferopol. Uh, and uh, we, we understand that Crimea have a huge role in this full-scale invasion. Of course, for missile strikes, of course, uh, for stolen uh, grains, 
uh, and uh, for this food crisis, but not only, actually. Okay, uh, Tamila, uh, but I will ask back, uh, there have been official statements by your president. Uh, and of course, uh, everybody is listening very carefully. Um, we have the West, uh, parts of the West, which are pushing very strong uh, towards negotiations, uh, not even taking into account whether Russia ever sent a sign that they want to negotiate. From what I know, they did not sign any, send any sign at all. Um, please tell us again, your president has made statements on Crimea and I think on the occupied territories, which have been called DNR, LNR. Maybe you remind us again of what mm -hmm. his statements were concerning yes, those. Mm -hmm. uh, very important actually to say that uh, this war start not on, uh, not on 24th of February yeah, this year. This war start eight years ago with occupation of Crimea. And of course, this war is finished with our victory only with the occupation of Crimea. And uh, our president, uh, our uh, political leaders, myself, uh, uh, stay on one position. We don't have any compromises about our territorial integrity about Crimea and Luhansk and Donetsk oblasts. And of course, we are uh, uh, working on uh, the occupation all of our territory. It's uh, only one actually position of our president as of now and in the future. Tamila, yes, I heard that. And I, if you take the case of Germany, we always said, okay, uh, we, uh, although there is a second state on our ground, which is called DDR, we still uh, claim that according to international law, um, uh, the German state is bigger. And we had a perspective from 1945 to 1990, which was 45 years, uh, which is, was, um, I would say, a mixture of realpolitik plus uh, staying to the law which I think is necessary, not only for Ukraine, but for the whole West, because this is what we have to understand. If law is overthrown, international law, we have nothing to hold on to anymore. The question though is, and I think I, I remember that Zelensky was talking about possible steps before. Uh, they have only one position. We uh, de occupied all our territories. Okay. And if we say about uh, some compromises, we don't, we, we don't even uh, talking about it because if uh, our Western partners say about values, values of human rights, of freedom, we understand in Crimea, we have, for example, one indigenous people population, yes, Crimean Tatar. And Crimean Tatars don't have any, uh, our, uh, any uh, another land, only Crimea, only in, in Ukraine. And I myself and Olga described situation with Crimean Tatar community, with Ukrainians, which are uh, prosecuted during these eight years. And if we now, after Bucha, Erpin, uh, talking about some compromises or uh, another steps, we understand that it's not the uh, values of uh, Europe, civilized uh, world, and of course, uh, Ukraine. It's not uh, actually uh, some very uh, good uh, um, uh, words. It's our values. It's values of Ukrainians. Okay. Thank you, Wilfried. Yes, only to, to add here, I mean, we should understand that if Ukraine will be able to conduct counter offenses which are successful, for example, in Kherson region and partly in the Donbass uh, in the future, we should understand that then also the situation on the Russian side is changing. And you should understand that 
these DNR and de facto LNR troops are not the best. And if they see that uh, Russia is losing ground, uh, we, we will see if there will be a need to really to the last uh, square kilometer to fight. Because I also can imagine that then we have another situation and they simply will run away because, of course, these people need not only a ruined Donbass, they need actually the new territories in the south to exploit the assets. That is also important for Mr. Aksyonov. He is very interested now in the Tavria gubernomor, um, as it was in the 19th century, because these people have so... Uh, are so unsuccessful in the occupied regions that they need new assets to exploit. And if that perspective will fade away, we also have another situation. So um, that is important to add. What we need for such counteroffensives, there was a question. I mean, we need, of course, for Ukraine, uh, combined heavy weapons uh, to throw uh, the, the enemy uh, over a certain distance, and that is what is lacking. And they need not only one Horwitzer or six Horwitzer or, or 12 Horwitzers, they need 90 or 100 Horwitzers to really establish troops. And if we now cannot deliver, but maybe deliver in October, we can now already to start the training of the soldiers. So I think there are possibilities, but we should be clear, here, Ukraine depends already absolutely on the West. On the West. Yes, dear friends, I think that is uh, what is the truth. What is our responsibility? It's if we talk about Crimeans opposing the Russian or yes, totalitarian system or Russians opposing their totalitarian system, uh, we should the fingers point back to us living in free countries uh, that we have the responsibility for our governments to accept their responsibility, which is not only due to values and uh, human rights, but which is also due to our interest because we have to understand if the international law uh, will be exchanged by the might of the most powerful one, this will be the end of the peace which we had after the Second World War, even if it was in parts a cold peace, but there was no open wars. There was occupation of countries. We should remember that, that there has been a Russian aggressiveness before towards Hungary, towards Poland, uh, towards Czechia, but not this kind of open war yet, like it has started. It's a new quality. I hope that it is not in the end alone the United States, which understand what is at stake, and that us Europeans show again that uh, we are not able of taking care of our own business. I remember 25 years ago, President Clinton was not willing to intervene in Bosnia because he said, where is that country? Isn't it within Europe? Why should we start moving? And I think if you look at the pre-election campaign in the United States, um, it, is a, it is difficult and dangerous for campaigners to explain that they now have to take care of Europe again because the European Union is not able to do it itself. So I hope that we get our governments going. That is, I think, the most, the, the duty we have. I hope that there will, no, will be no summer sleep in July and August, which is going to be dangerous because the hybrid propaganda machine and the war machine, the Russian war machine will go on. You Ukrainians definitely won't be able to go on vacation. So I think I should close the session with thank you all and Slava Ukraini. Thank you, bye-bye. Heroim Slava, thank you.
Thank you, colleagues. Goodbye.